This is Singapore Tonight. Good evening, I'm Steve Lai. Tonight's top stories. COVID-19 budget support has helped cushion the impact of recession. It could have hit the economy twice as hard. The first SIA flights with crews fully vaccinated against coronavirus take to the skies. It's Chinese New Year's Eve, but celebrations for the Year of the Ox are a muted affair this year due to the pandemic. COVID-19 means a new normal for a New Year tradition at the Kwan Im Thong Hood Cho Temple. Doors closed early today to avoid the large crowds who usually gather for the annual incense offering. And a new electronic waste disposal system for Singapore this year. I'm Don Tan. In the region tonight, Myanmar protesters rally outside the Chinese embassy in Yangon. They accuse Beijing of supporting the military coup. Joe Biden presses Xi Jinping on Hong Kong trade and human rights. In their first phone call since the US election, China warns confrontation would spell disaster for both sides. I'm Eugenia Lim with your Asia Business Update. How small businesses are coping with the cancellation of the New Year Chinatown Bazaar. Plus, Singta customer data may have been compromised by a data breach. Singapore's GDP for 2020 could have dropped by over 12% if not for a raft of budget support measures. The total costs over the past year has come close to $100 billion. The Finance Ministry's interim assessment report ahead of this year's budget shows relief measures helped halve the impact of COVID-19. But Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet says the fight is far from over. He says economic recovery is expected to be uneven and there'll be targeted help for sectors still under stress. And he says Singapore needs to remain or maintain fiscal discipline. Deborah Wong has more. Events manager Ji Wen En plans weddings and social functions at the hotel he works at. But when COVID-19 put a stop to these, he was at a loss. He had to move to the F&B department for six months. Wen En is one of a hundred staff in the Shangri-La Hotel Group who were redeployed to other roles last year. We were actually quite worried at first, but we were quite glad that the uh, hotel actually made an assignment for us to actually be redesignated. Basically, we get to learn something different. On average, hotels received a million dollars each to pay their employees wages under the job support scheme. It's tiered, so sectors hit hardest by the pandemic get more help. The share of total job losses from industries that were most affected halved after the grants were issued. Over $22 billion was given out under the scheme from April to December. That makes up the bulk of over $27 billion in grants given out to businesses in total last year, a sharp increase from the previous year. Without support, the finance ministry says the unemployment rate could have gone up even more to exceed 6%. Instead, unemployment rate stood at 4.1% last year. While many schemes are ongoing, our early findings are that the measures have helped to cushion the impact of the recession. The interim analysis is encouraging as it showed that the schemes are achieving the outcomes that they were designed for. But Mr Hink warned that the global climate remains uncertain. MOF expects the path to recovery to be longer than expected. Budget 2021 will be delivered on Tuesday. Nearly 76,000 people have secured work and training opportunities through Singapore's SG United Jobs and Skills Package. Nearly 80% have been placed into jobs. Now, at the end of last year, about 130,000 positions were still available. The scheme was launched to help job seekers affected by the weaker economic outlook. Alif Amsha with more. Richmond Chan graduated from his engineering course at the height of the pandemic and didn't land a full-time job even after searching for four months. That pushed him to take up a traineeship instead. Six months in, he's gained footing at his workplace. I came in with, basic, with real basic uh, programming knowledge, uh, having taken only one module in 
university. And uh, I feel that I've grown a lot in terms of learning technical skills. They're very essential in this industry. I believe that uh, this would further enhance and broaden my ability for uh, employability in the future as well. More companies are offering opportunities like this, especially in Infocom. The sector has seen over 10,000 placements for work and training since the SG United Jobs and Skills Package was rolled out in May. Healthcare provided almost 5,000 placements, including executive and support roles. Another 11,000 positions came from manufacturing, as well as professional and food services. In many of these sectors, these were for long-term jobs. The Manpower Ministry also estimates that about 110,000 workers have been hired so far under the Jobs Growth Incentive Scheme. JGI provides wage support for employers that increase their local workforce. About half of those hired were aged 40 and above. The food services sector added the most workers, with close to 18,000 new hires, followed by wholesale trade and retail. Various government schemes have helped tremendously to cushion the impact and save jobs. And beyond the numbers, the assistance actually made real difference to people's lives. We must continue to help our vulnerable workers, including PMEs, so that all of us can protect and strengthen our social compact. In terms of support for households, they received about $2,000 per member on average through schemes like the Care and Support Package. While those earning less generally get more help, households from the lowest income bracket received less than those in the second quintile. That's because many were retirees who did not qualify for work-related relief. Still, the Finance Ministry says these measures have helped to mitigate inequality. Further analysis on these schemes could be carried out in future. The first flights from Singapore Airlines, Silk Air and Scoot with fully vaccinated crews have taken off. Transport Minister Ong Kang has seen off the flights to Jakarta, Bangkok and Phnom Penh. It's a landmark day for a sector that's been crippled by COVID-19. Aviation and maritime workers have been prioritised for vaccinations because of the sector's importance and role in economic recovery. Gwena Tia with more. Flight stewardess Go Yiling is about to make history. Her flight to Jakarta is manned entirely by crew who've had both shots of the vaccine. Ms Go received her second dose just a few days ago. And while it takes up to two weeks for the body to build a strong response, she says she feels a lot safer doing her job. Because I'm flying around cross-border international, so it's very important that we protect ourselves and don't bring back any COVID or virus to anybody around us. SIA Group says more than 90% of cabin crew and pilots across its three airlines have signed up to be inoculated. Nearly all of them have received their first dose. We're confident that our crew will be substantially vaccinated, uh, certainly by end of uh, the next month, and that um, you would then expect that majority of our flights, vast majority, would be would be uh, crewed by uh, crew that fully vaccinated. Even as air crew and aviation staff get vaccinated, that doesn't necessarily spell the immediate return of flights and passengers. That still very much depends on border restrictions, especially in an unpredictable global situation that's constantly changing. Transport Minister Ong Yi Kang says vaccinating aviation workers not only raises confidence in Singapore as an air hub, it also helps keep the situation within the country stable. Given our, our situation where internally Singapore is quite safe, we have got the uh, virus under control with very low community cases, our biggest vulnerability is actually the border. If the border staff that come into contact with the outside world are all vaccinated, I think we really strengthen and we really we would have really taken a very big step in securing our border and keeping Singapore even safer. 39,000 or more than 90% of frontline staff in the aviation and maritime sectors have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. About 14,000 others working with bus and train operators have also gotten their first jabs. 
Singapore Airlines says that it will look at how measures can be strengthened to further protect flight crew. An SIA flight stewardess had tested positive for COVID-19 on Tuesday after flying to Dubai on a turnaround flight. Sharing updates on investigations into how she could have been infected, Transport Minister Ong Kang said that she hadn't interacted with any passengers. She only served one leg, it's a long haul. So coming back, she's no longer serving. Uh, so she was a passenger. And as passenger, she sat with the rest of her crew at the back with their own area, dedicated toilet. The rest of the crew that sat with her, they are okay. Yeah. So uh, only she was infected. And so uh, during the, the stopover, she came into contact with some cleaners uh, at the Dubai airport. So I think these are the facts that we are now looking at. About 250,000 people in Singapore have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Prime Minister Li Sien Lung gave this update in his Chinese New Year message as he urged more people to get their shots. PM Lee thanked the public for supporting the tough restrictions the government has had to implement. He said these measures are key to curbing a spike in infections experienced by other countries. These new waves of infections are caused by year-end celebrations where many people gathered and let their guard down. Mr Lee added that the measures have allowed Singapore to restart most of its economy, while he acknowledged the restrictions will dampen the festive mood as Singaporeans usher in the Year of the Ox. He said the country can look forward to more carefree celebrations when the pandemic is over. In the meantime, he said there are other ways to connect with family and friends. Singapore has reported 12 new COVID-19 cases. Three are in the community, and that is the highest daily number in nearly two weeks. The remaining nine cases are imported, and they'd all been placed on stay-home notice upon arrival. The national tally now stands at 59,759. With increased interactions over the Chinese New Year period, the health ministry is reminding everyone to be vigilant and adhere to safe management measures. Singapore is getting ready to ring in the new year under the shadow of the global pandemic, which makes it a very different vibe in Chinatown this year. Nisha Rahim is there and she joins us now. Uh, Nisha, in years gone by, it would be a buzzing atmosphere, but what is, like, what is it like this year round? Well, Steve, you know, it's just a few hours away till we usher in the year of the Orcs. I'm here at uh, Pagoda Street at Chinatown. Now, it's a popular spot where shoppers, you know, apparently are doing some last-minute shopping. I've spoken to some uh, visitors here. Well, you know, the, the vibes, I can tell you it's a decent turnout this time. Uh, you know, it started raining in the... I was here for a few hours now, and it started raining in the evening, but now uh, crowds were actually cleared up then. But now we're seeing the crowds actually returning to do, as I mentioned, uh, you know, last-minute shopping. Um, but visitors here, I think, were also surprised by the light-up uh, that was, of course, we were expecting for the spectacular street light of 888 lanterns to not actually illuminate this time because of safe distancing measures. But the Singapore Tourism Board actually said that this time, because of reduced crowds from previous weekends, um, you know, they are able to actually um, enable the lights. So there will be lights here at Chinatown. So in a way, the mood is sl slightly, you know, the festive mood is slightly starting to kick in for some visitors. Um, well, you know, let's really hear what the visitors had to say. Previous year was better because no COVID, no nothing, so it was better. But now because of COVID, everybody don't want to come out, they're scared to come out. Today is not so crowded, not like the last time got the... The Chinese New Year, Pasar Malam. Now, this year is uh, very, very quiet. Uh. You will see whether is there any, some goodies or, you know, things to actually buy. Yeah, probably to actually just prepare for Chinese New Year. Just basically walk around and see any New Year stuff for small deco. Just had my reunion dinner nearby. Yeah, so then come and take a walk. Okay. So actually, I'm not sure whether the lights were on previously. So I was a bit surprised when the lights came on. So I just popped by. Nisha, whenever there are crowds, safe distancing becomes a key concern. And it was likewise in Chinatown lately due to the festive season. Are crowds adhering to safety management measures there? 
Well, from our observation, Steve, they definitely are. We are seeing, of course, groups maintaining safe distancing. You know, safe entry protocols are being adhered to. And it's also, of course, with the help and support of, you know, many safety, safe distancing ambassadors, as well as police officers right here monitoring the crowds as well. Uh, you know, this time, of course, it's a muted affair when we're seeing lesser stalls here opening, I think due to the COVID-19 restrictions. But, uh, you know, even though it's a muted affair, visitors here, businesses here, well, they really, you know, they understand that it's because of the pandemic and, you know, they're just really here to soak up what's left of the atmosphere here. So, Steve, yeah, back to you. All right, May, thanks for that. Nisha Rahim speaking to us live from Chinatown. Still to come, Chinatown sellers take their wares online to make up for pandemic kit sales. Tokyo's Olympics chief apparently bowing to snowballing criticism and outrage over sexist remarks. My name is Douglas Lan. After my grandfather passed away, my family received a mysterious envelope of cash from a clan association. I meet young Singaporeans who take me on a quest to find out. Are clans even relevant today? Remember our house, Friday on CNA. during Malaysia's lockdown is bearing fruit for a number of gardeners as they harvest their efforts in good time for festive feasting. Your Asia Now will look at how a focus on traditions is keeping the spirit of the season alive, even if they cannot celebrate homecoming for the Chinese New Year holiday. February 16th is Budget Day. Tune in as Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Heng Sui Kiet, delivers the budget statement in Parliament. Tuesday, live on CNA and CNA YouTube. Welcome to Doha from every one of us. Even those working quietly behind the scenes. So you can relax and enjoy the perfect break in your journey. And when you leave with a smile, we know our day's work is done. Qatar Airways, welcome to our home. I'm a really competitive person, now, basically. So this is one of the only spots since my site deteriorated that I got to be competitive at it. Based entirely on my ability. Like if I work hard, I can improve. Doesn't matter how blind I am. <laughs> so when I tell people that I'm able to use a phone, when I tell people that my phone allows me to read emojis, <laughs> that I can do coding or that I write on a computer, people are totally surprised. This is not to mention all the other things that I get up to in my spare time. This is blind guy does makeup. <laughs> all this anticipation that I don't know how I'm going to start the video. Bihran, he has low vision. He cannot see far things. Even the close vision, he cannot see in detail. Even though he has visual challenges, I want to show how happy he is. This segment is brought to you by Xeon Corporation. Business tonight. With the annual Chinatown Chinese New Year Bazaar cancelled due to the pandemic, sellers have either turned to new concepts or moved their businesses online. However, they say a physical presence is still important for their products. Gwyneth Teo with more. They may not have in mind what to buy, but when they step in, they have see a lot of selections, a lot of varieties, they start, start choosing. 
from Chinese New Year goodies to household items and even assessment books. Sellers used to promote these items at bazaars around Singapore and rarely had their own retail space. Now, some 26 suppliers display their products at this concept store in Star Vista. It's curated by a former bazaar vendor who says business has fallen 70% compared to last Chinese New Year. But she's determined to make it work, along with her fellow vendors. Some of our vendors, because of the COVID, they have no place to sell the items. So they have to actually get a job outside. Then they have like stocks piled up at home. They bring their stocks here. I try to clear some of the remaining stocks. And it also helps a bit on their live food, which I feel is a very meaningful part of this concept store also. For this vendor, who manufactures cutlery out of rice husks, a physical presence helps him introduce the unusual material to customers. Hopefully this will help boost sales when he sets up an online store. When we put out into the online, then people can find our product. If we just put on our product, no people know about our product. Now at least the, on the plaza side, on the off, uh, that means on the plaza side, so people will know our product first, then they can search our product in our online, even though in Lazada or Shopee's. Our shopping centres used to hold sales and events in big open spaces like this. But since the pandemic, such atrium events have not been allowed in order to prevent crowds from gathering. And sellers that depend on such bazaars say their business has taken a hit. This family-run business still has booths at two shopping malls this year. But it's a far cry from the stall it had at the Chinatown Bazaar for the past 20 years. The stall was used to attract new customers, who would then place orders on its website for the rest of the year. But with physical space limited due to the pandemic, the business decided to try out an online marketplace last December. At physical stores, they no longer allow samples to be given to customers. So in that sense, uh, we may not be able to get new customers who uh, have not tried our products before. But, uh, but because we have uh, gone on this new online platform, we are sort of getting new customers through the platform instead of uh, at the physical store. Still, not all customers prefer online shopping. Some customers prefer to really look at the physical product and touch it and look at it before they make the purchase. So we would still like to continue to reach out to those customers, you know, if we have a chance to do uh, bazaars again. Singtel's customer information may have been compromised after one of its third-party vendors was hit by a hacking attack. Singapore's largest telco says a file transfer system that it uses to share information internally and with external parties had been attacked by unidentified hackers. It has stopped using the system and is working with cybersecurity experts and the authorities to investigate the matter. Singtel is also conducting an impact assessment to determine the extent of the data breach. But the company stresses that the incident is an isolated one and core operations remain unaffected. According to the vendor Excellion, the affected system is a 20-year-old product nearing the end of its life cycle. One cybersecurity expert says such legacy software represents a security risk in itself. Often, such software lacks more in security features like, for example, two-factor authentication that would prevent malicious attackers accessing uh, files, even if a password would be compromised. Often, such systems lack other security features like file encryption or even proper audit logs, which makes it very, very hard to figure out what's going on if attack happened. So overall, I would say that a, a mature organization with a mature security program would properly manage the life cycle of such systems and phase them out before they become a security risk. Malaysia's economy has contracted at its fastest pace in more than two decades. GDP was down 5.6% last year, the worst performance since the Asian financial crisis. For the fourth quarter, the economy shrank 3.4% on year, worse than forecast as a resurgence of COVID-19 forced new restrictions. The services sector was a major drag, down by nearly 5%. A major focus now is relaxing curbs on small businesses. The central bank chief says hopes for recovery are pinned on the vaccine rollout that begins later this month. 
the outlook for external demand is stronger compared with last year, with positive developments surrounding the rollout of vaccine. With the global economy on a recovery path, the fit for purpose restrictions and SOPs in the manufacturing sector enables our exporters to capitalize on this robust demand. The launch of the vaccination program in Malaysia later this month will lift sentiment and provide a clear path towards resolving the pandemic. Hong Kong's flag carrier Cathay Pacific is axing all flights to Australia except for Sydney. A number of other long-haul flights, including to Vancouver, San Francisco, Frankfurt and Amsterdam, are also being called. The move comes after the Hong Kong government enforced a mandatory 14-day quarantine on all flight crew who've stayed outside China. Cathay says that will affect its ability to service flights. Volkswagen and Microsoft are joining forces to develop self-driving cars. The automaker will tap on Microsoft's cloud computing services so it can deploy software updates to cars faster. Vehicles already on the road with driver assistance features could be able to receive software updates over time, possibly bringing them closer to autonomous driving. AstraZeneca is expecting its profits to grow this year after beating forecasts for quarterly drug sales. It says growth in earnings will be 18 to 24 percent after a 15 percent rise last year. The London listed firm says its forecast does not include any impact from its COVID-19 vaccine. It plans to report sales of the inoculation separately. The company has pledged not to profit from the vaccine during the pandemic. Much is riding on the British developed shot since it's cheaper and can be distributed more easily than vaccines from its competitors. That's it for business. Back to you, Don. Thanks very much, Eugenia. Well, still to come, tensions ease between China and India over the Himalayan border after months of talks. Melbourne is keen to conduct more COVID-19 tests to lock down an outbreak at a quarantine hotel. stories in Asia. A quicker, portable way of testing for COVID-19 in just five minutes. To breaking news in the US and Europe. US President-elect Joe Biden is set to formally introduce his top economic team. With an eye on markets opening across the world. Wall Street's major indices all closed the month with double-digit percentage gains. It's the one bulletin that offers you a global perspective. World Tonight, daily on CNA. February 16th is Budget Day. Tune in as Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Heng Sui Kiet, delivers the budget statement in Parliament. Tuesday, live on CNA and CNA YouTube.
I'm designing a fashion collection inspired by the decade before my time. Wow, so guys used to wear heels. That's the first time that Singapore had used the word boutique. They didn't even know how to say boutique. Right. They went boutique. <laughs> I'll showcase the collection at my first fashion show. <laughs> One minute to show time. Updating tonight's top stories, a shot in the arm for the travel industry, the first flights from Singapore Airlines, Silk Air and Scoot with fully vaccinated crews have taken off. COVID-19 budget support has helped cushion the impact of recession. It could have hit the economy twice as hard. Well, for more, we're joined by Rajiv Biswas, Asia Pacific Chief Economist at IHS Market. Mr. Biswas, the government rolled out five budgets last year to support workers, families, businesses. Do you think that they've achieved their aims? <laughs> I think the Singapore government's uh, done a huge amount to try to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. It, you know, the, it was a devastating impact on most countries all around the world. And the Singapore government has put in an, um, over $100 billion of stimulus measures to try to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And according to their estimates, if they hadn't done that, the economy, the GDP would have contracted by over 12%. Because of these stimulus measures, the contraction is estimated to be about half of that at about 5.8% contraction. Still a very negative number, but much better than it would have been without all of those support measures. Most of the help for businesses went into the jobs support scheme. What do you think will be the impact when the scheme actually ends this year? Well, the support scheme was very, very important in terms of uh, mitigating the impact on the labour market during the very, very severe period in the second quarter of 2020, when there was quite a strict lockdown in place for many months. So I think, you know, it was very important at that point. And according to the government estimates, uh, that job support scheme has helped to save or create you know over 150,000 jobs so it's been very very important of course the economy has been improving in the second half of 2020 um, at an uneven pace across industry sectors but nevertheless according to our own surveys that ihs market does of the economy there's been quite a rebound in economic activity in the second half so that's provided more positive economic momentum and it's reduced the vulnerability of many areas in terms of jobs so the the need for such widespread job support measures may be less uh, but clearly some industry sectors will still be facing tremendous challenges, even in 2021. Obviously, sectors like tourism, entertainment, aviation are sectors that are still being very badly hit by the impact of the global pandemic and travel bans around the world. And, and Mr. Biswas, bearing in mind that COVID-19's impact still weighs on Singapore's economy, despite that, that uh, recovery, some recovery that you mentioned just now, how long do you think the economic fallout from the pandemic can persist? Well, I think when we look at 2021, it's going to be a year of recovery. So much better than what we've just come through in 2020. Uh, we expect that the world will be growing at a pace of about 4.5%, which is pretty strong, and Singapore to be growing at about 4.8%, which is a pretty good growth rate. But clearly, the pace of recovery will be quite different ac across countries and also across industry sectors. Singapore is seeing quite a big rebound in sectors such as electronics, uh, obviously, pharmaceuticals and medical equipment was anyway doing quite well in 2020, given uh, the pandemic demand. But electronics is growing and at the moment. Exports are up 14% year on year in terms of electronics exports. 
So there's some real big recoveries happening. Uh, obviously, consumer demand has also improved. But when we look at the rest of the economy, there will be some sectors that are lagging. Uh, as I mentioned, tourism, entertainment, aviation will still be struggling. So I think we should expect to see an uneven pace of recovery across the Singapore economy. And probably some sectors may not reach their normal levels of activity, pre-pandemic levels of activity, until 2022. But some sectors are already doing very well in terms of recovery. As I mentioned, there's quite a big electronics boom happening globally right now. And Singapore is very well positioned for that because about a quarter of manufacturing output is related to electronics. So Singapore is very well positioned to benefit from that upturn in electronics demand in consumer markets around the world. And based on the interim report, what kind of support do you think will be needed in the upcoming budget that we'll be hearing from next week? I think the scale of support will not need to be as substantial as we've uh, just come through in 2020. I think there will need to still be support for some parts of the economy that are lagging the overall recovery. So I think that uh, there will be more targeted support measures needed to help the transition from that extremely ugly recession of 2020 uh, through the recovery year. The year of the ox will be a year of recovery and a transition year towards a more normal economy by 2022. But I think the government will need targeted support measures in place to help those sectors that are lagging the pace of recovery to try to uh, get through that period. And a lot of small to medium enterprises will continue to need support. Uh, it's obviously been very difficult conditions for many segments uh, of small businesses. And I think you know some measures will still be needed depending on which sector they're in. So I think more targeted measures will probably be very much the focus of the upcoming budget measures. Mm. We sit on the verge of the year of the ox. Let's hope it's a good one. Mr Biswas, thank you very much for your thoughts this evening. We've been speaking there to Rajiv Biswas, Asia-Pacific Chief Economist at IHS Market. In regional news, Myanmar has arrested dozens more politicians and activists as protests continue against the military coup. Now demonstrators are also taking aim at China, claiming Beijing supports the overthrow. Protesters have also received a boost from U.S. President Joe Biden, who has ordered sanctions against military leaders. Hundreds have protested outside the Chinese embassy in Yangon. They accuse Beijing of supporting the military government. China has denied this. It's also rubbish social media reports that Chinese planes have brought in technical personnel to Myanmar. Across Myanmar, similar scenes are playing out for a sixth day, despite concerns that the military might soon take a harsher stance against demonstrators. A local civil society organization has tweeted a draft cybersecurity bill sent to telecom companies. That bill would allow the army to order blackouts and website bans. It would also require social media platforms to hand over users' data. A new wave of detentions has also begun. A close aide to ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi is the latest high-profile arrest. Kyo Tin Swaip served as minister for the office of the state councillor. Leaders of the former Electoral Commission have also been arrested. And the U.S. is doubling down on that pressure, with President Joe Biden taking his strongest actions yet. He slapped sanctions on military leaders who directed the coup and their family members. Mr. Biden will identify the first round of targets this week. But sanctions on Myanmar's military leaders may not have much effect, as an analyst explains. 
The impact will ultimately be limited because the military for many years has suffered from sanctions and has accustomed itself to dealing through informal channels. There's a huge conflict economy in Myanmar, it lives off jade and, and narcotics, from which a great deal of income is derived in the country. And so these formal sanctions on the military, I don't think will have much impact. The important thing, of course, is that many people were saying that it's the Myanmar people that are suffering, not just because of the coup, but because of the COVID pandemic. The levels of poverty and unemployment have increased. And so it's important for the international community not to bring more suffering upon the Myanmar people themselves. There is a great deal of suspicion that China may be supportive of the military. I don't think that's necessarily the case. And from what we've seen of debate within China, there is a divided opinion on this. But nonetheless, I think there are concerns and suspicions about China's support for the current situation. U.S. President Joe Biden has pressed Chinese leader Xi Jinping on Hong Kong, trade and human rights in their first phone call since his inauguration. His call to Mr. Xi came on the same day that Taiwan officials met State Department diplomats in Washington. According to the White House, Mr. Biden expressed concerns about Beijing's unfair economic practices. He also brought up the crackdown in Xinjiang and China's assertive actions in the South China Sea. China says that Mr. Xi warned Mr. Biden that confrontation would spell a disaster for both countries. Ties between both sides hit new lows during the Trump administration, and Chinese state media called this a chance for a new start. 当前,中美关系正处于重要关口。推动中美关系健康稳定发展是两国人民和国际社会的共同期盼。你说过,美国最大的特点是可能性。希望现在,这种可能性朝着有利于两国关系改善的方向发展。Simon Marks tells us a new Pentagon task force on China is now working to turn things around. Certainly, Joe Biden uh, is signaling to the United States and to China that he needs more time before deciding exactly what his strategy uh, towards Beijing is going to be. So this review by the Pentagon is going to look at America's military footprint in Asia, technology and the use of it by both the United States and the Chinese in the region, intelligence gathering capacities, the role of allies and partnerships and other areas of strategy. And that issue about looking at the role of allies and partnerships is absolutely key here because what President Biden is essentially presenting to President Xi is a situation in which when the United States communicates with China, it doesn't do so simply on its own behalf, but is doing so on behalf of a coalition of democracies. And that's why the Pentagon review, coupled with the geopolitical efforts that are underway by the Biden administration to reach out to governments in the region, uh, including the government of Singapore, the government of Japan, uh, with whom talks have already been had, according to uh, White House officials 24 hours ago. All of that is intended to create uh, what Joe Biden describes as a whole of government strategy towards China. Between now and the point at which that strategy is going to be unveiled, all of the Trump era tariffs and hardline policies towards China will remain unchanged. Tokyo Olympics chief Yoshiro Mori is expected to step down tomorrow following sexist comments that sparked outrage in Japan and abroad. He came under fire after saying women talked too much at an Olympic committee meeting. Mr. Mori has apologized again, telling local media he could not let the contro controversy drag on and that he will explain his situation tomorrow. The International Olympic Committee had earlier considered the matter closed, but branded his remarks completely inappropriate and crit as criticism grew. The saga adds to the general disquiet over plans to hold the Games this summer, despite the ongoing pandemic. どんな影響を及ぶかって日本人もやっぱり海外の方も結構厳しいですし日本のこれまでのその考え方の変革のいいチャンスというかこういう発言をする人はやめることになるっていう一つの
指標というかできたと思うのですごく意味があることだと思います。Mayor of the Olympics Village, Saburo Kawabushi, is widely expected to replace Mr. Mori. Reports say the pair have met and Mr. Mori asked him to take the post. Mr. Kawabushi told reporters that he would do his best to hold a successful Games if he is appointed. India and China have agreed to pull back troops from a key hotspot on their disputed border in the Himalayas. The breakthrough comes after a long military standoff and nine rounds of talks. Thousands of troops from both sides have begun disengaging from the Pangong Tso area in eastern Ladakh. They've also agreed to dismantle defense structures. <laughs> अप्रैल 2020 से नॉर्थ एंड साउथ बैंक पर किया गया है उन्हें हटा दिया जाएगा और पुरानी स्थिति कायम कर दी जाएगी Once the first phase is complete India says its military will meet within 2 days to discuss pulling back from other areas Beijing has urged India to keep its word the move is a positive turn in the worst military confrontation between the two neighbors in decades the standoff began in April last year when India accused Chinese troops of intruding across the border 20 Indian soldiers were killed in clashes while the number of Chinese casualties is unknown Melbourne is calling on residents to come forward and get tested for COVID-19 there are concerns of growing community transmission of the more infectious UK variant of the coronavirus. A cluster linked to a quarantine hotel has grown to 11 cases. All three of the new infections in Victoria today are linked to the Holiday Inn. They were already isolating. However, more contact tracing is underway. Over 22,000 tests have been carried out in the past 24 hours. Still to come, border closures have forced Malaysians working in Singapore to spend the festive season away from family and friends. And the Kwan Im Thong Hood Cho Temple takes steps to prevent crowding ahead of the Chinese New Year. It was eerily similar to the SARS outbreak. There were cynics and people skeptical and saying, were we overreacting? He asked me, sister, am I going to die? We know every decision impacts people and businesses. Leaving no Singaporean behind. If they wanted to come back, we would have to find a way. Believe, Saturday and Sunday on CNA. The concept of peering and looking and discovering is important. Artist shows his idea through a painting. I show myself throughout dishes that I make. Remarkable Living Season 3, Sunday on CNA. Every day, the financial world goes through dramatic rise and falls. We'll track the biggest market movers and show you where the opportunities lie. Get the experts' take on the performance of key indices. Plus all the analysis to help you understand forces driving global economies. The daily business news you need, only on CNA. This segment is brought to you by Xeon Corporation. February 16th is Budget Day. Tune in as Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Heng Sui Kiet, delivers the budget statement in Parliament. Tuesday, live on CNA and CNA YouTube. Recycling your old computers, refrigerators or televisions will be easier from July. The National Environment Agency has appointed a new operator to manage consumer electrical and electronic waste across Singapore for five years. German recycling company Alba 
is the first to be awarded the Producer Responsibility Scheme operating license in Singapore. To meet NEA targets, the company will set up e-waste bins at places like town councils, shopping malls, and community centers. It will also schedule collection drives and provide doorstep pickup services for a fee. All the collected e-waste will be sent to licensed recyclers. As part of the scheme, large retailers will also have to offer customers free take-back services for unwanted goods. One Town Council says that the new operator will help them deal with the problem of irresponsible dumping. A lot of the e-waste are actually thrown uh, at common areas, especially the bulkier ones, including fridge or even washing machine. So for the cleaners to clear that, it takes up a big portion of their time. With Alba on board, we have been looking at improving convenience and accessibility for companies' residents to recycle their e-waste. Currently, the public can only dispose of their e-waste at collection points offered by different businesses or by contacting their town council's bulky waste removal services. One expert says that having a single manager will provide an organised way of collecting e-waste and enable tracking. The Kwan Im Thonghood Cho Temple on Waterloo Street closed its doors early today on the eve of Chinese New Year to prevent crowds from gathering. Its annual incense offering ceremony has been cancelled, which usually sees many people thronging the temple at midnight. About 5,500 devotees still turned up to give their offerings. Lo Min Min reports. For the first time in over a hundred years, the Kwan Im Thong Hut Cho Temple is closing its doors early on Chinese New Year Eve. It used to open all the way until 7 p.m. on the first day of the New Year. It's just after 6.30 p.m. now and the crowd is long gone. But in previous years, this place would have been packed with people that it would be hard to even walk around. As of this afternoon, the queue is more than 100 meters long, but it was moving quite quickly. People told me they took just 30 minutes to enter the temple. From what I understand, some activities were restricted. People were not allowed to ask for fortune sticks because these were shared. They were also required to take their flower offerings with them when they leave the temple. At any one time, only 50 people were allowed to enter. And at about noon, the temple was closed for 15 minutes for sanitization. Before the pandemic struck, one of the most anticipated activities was the midnight incense offering ceremony. Huge crowds of people would be gathered here as the clock strikes 12, racing to be the first to place their joysticks. The belief is that the first person to do that will receive the most blessing from the goddess of mercy. But that's not happening this year. And people I spoke to said it's a good thing that the temple is managing the crowds this year. The previous one where there's such a wow, you know, so magnificent, you know, crowd, and then bring up the Chinese spirit. We have to make a do for the new year, even though the virus is uh, hitting us, but we are still very lucky uh, on the whole. Since I all the way come, I also have to pray, uh, pray for my family, my friends. So far, everything is okay. Uh. Everything, everybody queue and then got distancing should be safe. Uh. Some of the worst hit are the vendors. They tell me that the first 15 days of the new year are when they make the most profits and some vendors expect their business to be hit by 60 to 70 percent this year. The temple will remain closed until the fourth day of the new year. Thousands of Malaysians will be spending Chinese New Year away from family. They're stuck here in Singapore because of travel restrictions brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Afifa Arifin finds out how they're celebrating the festive season away from home. Celebrating Chinese New Year this year will be a whole new experience for 56-year-old banker Ho Chin Shin. It's his first time spending it away from his family and friends in his hometown Sarawak in East Malaysia. 
despite living abroad in Singapore for about eight years now. In Kuching, our Chinese New Year celebrations have always been the, a blast. Is uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of uh, sights and sounds, firecrackers. I remember that I would buy the flight tickets from uh, Singapore to uh, Sarawak like uh, 10 months before the uh, next uh, Chinese New Year. Uh, this year, unfortunately, uh, the uh, ticket has been uh, cancelled. The flights have been cancelled. So. Uh, is uh, something that is uh, totally uh, unexpected. Like Mr Ho, returning home for the festive break is not an option for many Malaysians living or working in Singapore due to the ongoing travel restrictions. So to help some Malaysians feel less alone this festive season, some members of the Malaysian Association in Singapore have welcomed their fellow countrymen into their homes. That's the culture we grew up with, you know, the open house, the feeding people, the wanting to welcome people from our own home, our hometown, um, into our own homes. You know, it, as long as we're Malaysian, we all kind of understand each other. Um, so this is really why the initiative even started. Healthcare frontliner Wendy Ng has also chosen to remain here. She's concerned by the state of COVID-19 infections across the causeway and is also deterred by the costs and time in quarantine which one has to bear in order to cross borders. I think the quarantine time serve is the major issue and also because I work in a high-risk environment, I, don't really, I really do not want to bring any transmission back and forth whether to my family or to my patients. Instead, Miss Ng will celebrate with her colleagues, some of whom are also unable to return to their respective countries. She's also lucky to have some familiar faces here, friends who have become like a second family to her. But even as Malaysians here embrace a different festive season, the thought of missing family reunion dinners still stung. I think um, it has been tough. Actually, it's already been a year that I haven't been able to see them. Um, you know, it's going to be another birthday missed, um, another Chinese New Year missed. So I think the best I can do right now is just call my mom every day and my dad as well, you know, video call. At least we have technology right now. With vaccinations being rolled out globally, it's hoped that the time will soon come for borders to be reopened and families reunited. For many across Asia, it's Happy New Year. The Year of the Ox is just hours away. While celebrations across the region have been scaled down this year, that hasn't dampened the festive spirit. In Taiwan, traditional markets are abuzz after much success in containing the pandemic. While in Wuhan, it's a poignant celebration a year after overcoming the pandemic. But many are hoping the year of the ox will bring better luck, wealth and importantly, with the pandemic in mind, health. And from all of us here in the team on CNA, we certainly wish you all the best as well. Well, that's Singapore tonight. We'll leave you now with Chinese New Year celebrations across the region. Good night.